Yeah, uh, welcome. Uh, thanks for showing up. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, let's uh, first start with a brief history of uh, Ubuntu Touch. I don't know, um, probably it doesn't need that much introduction, but maybe there are some people here that uh, haven't really heard of, about it before. So um, let's start. Um, starting in uh, 2012, there was uh, some rumors about uh, Ubuntu coming to mobile devices. One of the first incarnations was uh, this. It, it was called uh, Ubuntu for Android back then. Um, it was a, a concept and, um, and actually a working system where you could uh, have an Android phone and then connect it to a display and then would boot up in, uh, into an actual Ubuntu container that you could uh, use on the phone. Um, but that wasn't really uh, pursued that much after. And uh, in 2013 um, at MWC, Canonical then, introduced Ubuntu for phones, Ubuntu Touch. It wasn't really sure how to, how to call it back then, uh, but uh, at least this was the concept. And uh, it had always a key word in it, that, and that was convergence. So um, Mark Shuttleworth uh, then later that year launched um, a campaign for a, a new phone, a new kind of phone um, called the Ubuntu Edge. Um, which I think was the, the dream, I think, of every, every Ubuntu user, or every Linux user in general back then. It was supposed to be a very, very powerful phone that uh, was supposed to dual boot Ubuntu and Android, and uh, you were supposed to be also be able to use Ubuntu applications in the, in the phone view and uh, on the desktop. Back then, the, the crowdfunding campaign for this Ubuntu Edge phone um, had a a, a whopping goal of uh, 32 million dollars. It uh, collected record-breaking 12 million dollars, but uh, if you do the math, 12 million is less than 32 million, so uh, that didn't uh, exactly work out as planned. Um, but still, the concept stood. I think, in fact, uh, CNET back then declared it uh, their best of show at, uh, at um, MWC 2013. And uh, yeah, the concept went through uh, various um, iterations. The design went through various iterations. At first, it looked kind of similar to uh, Unity 7, as you know it from the desktop, and as it still looked uh, two years ago. Um, uh, but yeah, finally, they settled on uh, this. Oh, you can't really see it. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe uh, just come by later at the, at the UB Ports booth where you can actually get your hands uh, dirty with the system. Um, so th finally they settled on this uh, design language. They called it Suru and um, actually ended up with a pretty interesting concept of Ubuntu on the phone. Um, and it was, um, it was a system crafted with uh, a lot of intention to detail. It was really really a beautiful system and um, we ended up with a couple of phones. After this campaign failed, they uh, didn't launch the Ubuntu Edge as it was planned and instead launched a couple of uh, cheaper phones with some hardware partners. About uh, two hardware partners were that, uh, BQ and Meizu, so a Spanish company and a Chinese company and uh, I think six phones in total were sold with Ubuntu Touch. So, what even is convergence? Um, convergence means uh, two things. On the one hand, uh, you, have, um, you have the option to install traditional applications that you know from Ubuntu on the desktop, on the phone, and on the other hand, the phone applications um, adjust. So you can, uh, you can, for example, connect your phone to your PC and then it will, uh, it will switch to a windowed layout and you will be able to use the same applications and seamlessly um, switch between a, a phone and a desktop and um, also be really be able to, uh, to use the same applications everywhere. So that was the idea. Use Ubuntu everywhere, bring Ubuntu to all the devices. Very interesting concept. Um, and it was pursued for quite a while. So let's take a look at uh, how this works out at the moment. It's, it's perfect. It's, it's the GIM. Let me just get a new... Yeah. See, can you do that? And that's not, that should be the perfect. 
That is the pepper. Let me just pull that size up. There we go. Can you do this on your iPhone? Yeah. The game. Amazing. Just okay that. There we go. Can you do that on your iPhone? I think I just downed my green. This is you can take this outside. You don't have to be at your your desktop anymore. Now I just need to save this and it's easy because because it's GIMP and it's not on the iPhone. It's going to go you just going to it's going to it's it's going to no file. You're just going to it's going to Good. It's good, okay. Okay, so there might be some slight issues with that yet. <laughs> um, but it, the idea is, is a pretty good one. Um, and if you look at this, um, Brian Landuk is probably a name that uh, you don't associate with the uh, big lover of Ubuntu. But he called it um, like a magical uni unicorn that farts rainbows. The idea of having um, traditional Linux applications on your phone. Um, since uh, this video was taken that I showed before, um, some improvements have been made. It's not at a point where we would want it to be. Um, but at least you get the idea and you get that it's a concept that is worth pursuing. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is where we were a year ago. A pretty... Um, a pretty usable system that uh, some people actually uh, use as a daily driver. A lot of people actually use it as a daily driver, so uh, these phones that were sold uh, resonated pretty well. Um, as I showed before, there are issues with it, but um, it's a system that you can use if you are willing to live with its limitations. So one year ago, um, April 5th, um, Mark Shuttleworth came then out uh, with the announcement that um, there were going to be changes in the company and that um, Ubuntu for phones would no longer be a, a development priority and that um, Ubuntu would shift back the focus to GNOME in the next LTS that uh, is now released. I think um, most of the Ubuntu Touch users were pretty, um, pretty upset then and uh, really this is why I call this talk uh, one year after the world ended because it, it, that's what it felt like. So many people were so dedicated to this idea and um, 100 people, I think, or even more, were let go after, after this uh, announcement from Canonical and um, so, many, uh, so much work has, has gone into this and so many great ideas have gone into this. Um, so this is, uh, it was a pretty weird situation, both for the community and both for the, for the people that uh, worked at Canonical and were very uncertain what, what their future was going to look like. So this is where uh, UbiPorts enters the stage. Uh, UbiPorts existed before already as a small community of um, porters. It's already in there. So what, uh, what we did is we brought um, Ubuntu Touch to other devices. We have a very small community, as I said. Um, it was mainly, it revolved mainly about uh, around one person, um, Mario Gripskant, who can't be here because of family, of a uh, complicated family situation um, at the moment, but uh, he essentially founded the community in order to support um, bringing Ubuntu Touch to different devices, except from the commercial ones that uh, Canonical offered at the time. So, um, at that point already, a year ago, we had, um, for example, the Fairphone 2, the OnePlus One, the Nexus 5, um, were phones that uh, UbiPorts um, ported Ubuntu Touch to, and they were all almost ready. <laughs> um, not entirely, for example, the Fairphone 2 still has a lot of issues, unfortunately, um, but at least this is what we did. So. At, um, at the 
Ubuntu Touch launch event in uh, 2015, when the first commercial phones were revealed and the Ubuntu insiders were invited to uh, London, I think. Um, uh, Christian Perino, who was uh, the leader of the mobile team at that time, um, said in an interview on the question if uh, Ubuntu Touch was ever going to be shut down, um, that they wanted, to, they wanted the people to love it and then it would develop a life of its own. And I think that's exactly what's, what uh, we saw happening. I hate to admit it, but uh, in, in the first couple of days after the, the news dropped and uh, people in the UbiPods community started to think out loud about whether we should pick up the system, I was against it. <laughs> I uh, thought, we cannot do this, it's, uh, it's too much work. At, um, our community was very organized on Telegram and uh, on the first day we hit the limit of members that can join into a Telegram group. And uh, then we thought, okay, there really is interest here. Um, this is really something worth pursuing. So this is uh, why we kept on fighting. And um, why do we even need Ubuntu on the phone? I mean, we have Ubuntu on the desktop, it's fine. And we have uh, Android on the phone, so we have Linux on the phone, right? Um, but the thing is, Ubuntu Touch is true GNU Linux. Why do I stress that so much? Why, why do I stress the GNU component? Uh, it's not only that I'm afraid that Richard Stallman will uh, probably murder me in my sleep if I don't do it. Um, it's also because Android is not true GNU Linux. Um, if, you, if you ever uh, used ADB um, and ADB shell, then you will just find that there's uh, stuff, um, stuff that you would expect to be there in a terminal on a normal uh, GNU Linux system is just not there on Android. And um, that's why it would be very interesting to have an actual GNU Linux, have an actual full Ubuntu stack running on a phone and having that in your pocket. Um, and also, Android is, of course, very dependent on Google. Of course, you can use only the open source components of Android, but um, with the development you see with every new Android version, more and more vital components of Android are moved into the proprietary Google Play services. Um, so it's very important that we, uh, that we keep an alternative system for that alive. So um, everybody who really knows a lot about the inner workings of Ubuntu, please close your eyes at this moment um, because I will uh, talk shortly about the technical side of it. Uh, so this is how Ubuntu usually looks. You have your hardware, um, you have your uh, drivers based on glibc, it's a C library. Um, you have your Linux kernel, 4 point uh, something, a pretty recent one, and then you have your user land above that. So in an ideal world, Ubuntu Touch would look exactly the same. Um, you would probably change out some components. For example, in this, uh, we changed out the X11, the X server, the display server you, you, know, you normally use, and uh, changed it out with, out with Mir or Wayland, if, you, uh, into, if you're into that sort of thing. And uh, then we use a newer version of the, uh, of the uh, user interface, and that's basically it. Um, the problem is we want to run on a phone, and uh, phones usually, usually run Android. Um, if you look at the user land, it, uh, this is not what it actually looks like, but it's what it feels like. So there's a lot of Java in Android, um, and the drivers are not uh, compatible with the normal kernel. For, on the one hand, the kernel in Android is usually very old, so it's... Uh, it's almost always um, uh, part of the 3 series, and uh, the drivers are not based on glibc, so it's uh, um, called Bionic, the library. Um, don't confuse it with, uh, with the name of the new Ubuntu release, it's uh, completely unrelated. But uh, yeah, this is what it normally looks like. So this is what we do for um, Ubuntu Touch. We um, have a system called Halium, which is um, small container of Android that, um, that your Android is running in, only the very low level components of, an, of Android. You have your kernel in there that also comes from the manufacturer. You have some uh, management scripts and then you have the translation library called libhybris. 
and that translates all the API calls, um, the, the, all, the, all the driver calls uh, to this uh, Bionic drivers. So you can then just use your normal Ubuntu user land and uh, move on with your life. There are some, uh, some extra problems on Android. Uh, if you look here, you have a recovery and a bootloader rather than a normal BIOS, like you would expect it on a desktop. Um, and there's very little standardization on Android. So uh, every device basically um, does it differently. Uh, but you then have to figure it out. You have to uh, work around a lot of issues, especially. Okay, so this is uh, what UbiPods used to do back then. Um, when we started to take over the whole operating system, of course, we said, okay, we need to make some, some changes to the organization. So what we're busy with at the moment is setting up the UbiPods Foundation. Um, it's going to be a registered nonprofit foundation under German law. We model it after the um, Document Foundation, the developers uh, behind uh, LibreOffice. Um, if you talked to me before, I think uh, I might have already told you about this, and then I might have said something like, okay, it's going to be live in three months or something. And then if you talk to me three months after that, I also said, okay, it's going to be live in three months. So why does it take so long? Um, there's a lot to consider. <laughs> there's a lot to consider when setting up uh, something like this. Uh, so uh, we had a very generous sponsor who is willing to help us with this. Um, but of course, you want to make sure that your statutes are fine, that your legal system are fine. You want to make sure that the legal structure you, are, you have chosen uh, works in your favor and that uh, you want to eliminate issues before they come up. So this is uh, why the foundation is still not there, even one year after we started working on it. Um, but at least now we are in the point where I can say, okay, in three months it's going to be there. <laughs> um, and I can say that with a little more confidence. Um, so yeah, we are in, in uh, talks with the government because you have to approve your, um, your statutes have to be approved by the government so that you get, can get a tax exempt status, that you um, are legally on the, on the secure side. We have talked with our attorney, our lawyer, and the government to uh, pre-approve it. And then in three months, uh, it looks pretty good. Okay, so um, we are a small community, right? So um, how can we do this? How can we um, how can we change the world if Canonical couldn't do it with 100 people or more, essentially? Um, we will make some changes in strategy, and we already did uh, start to make changes in strategy. So um, our roadmap, essentially, it's probably a little much to call it a roadmap, but uh, our activities at the moment um, are divisible in, in three categories. On the one hand, of course, we want to, um, to create a daily driver-ready device. Uh, from our download numbers, we think we um, have around 5,000 active devices at the moment. Of course, we can't know if those people actually use it as their daily driver and as their only phone, or if they also have an Android phone or an, or an iPhone or whatever or maybe someone has just uh, 4,000 devices lying around and he's always updating them. That's possible. Um, but yeah, this is, uh, this is one of our, this is the first category, I would say. Um, improve the software stack so it's possible to use it as a daily driver because you want your community to be motivated. And um, it, in order to be excited about um, software, you need to be able to use it. And uh, if you can't use your phone really, then it's, uh, it's pretty difficult to get excited about it. Because if, if there is an issue, even if it's a small one, and it's bugging you every day, you will probably one day go out and fix it, or try to fix it, or help with it. So uh, it's a lot easier to get excited about a product if you are able to use it. The second category is improved compatibility. Um, Canonical really tried to change the world. And um, in some areas they did, but in, in other areas um, it 
turn out to be too much, at least in the way they did it. I, would, I don't want to go in the details everywhere, um, but it's, uh, it, it, it's a difficult situation. Of course, uh, 2013, when they started out, a lot of the, the standards we see today didn't really exist yet. Um, so it was a difficult situation back then. Um, but there are examples where you would say, okay, they probably should have settled on a different standard. Um, back then, they always had the idea, okay, we will replace this with a solution that is better. Uh, we don't have that luxury because we don't have the, the millions behind us. We have substantial funding and uh, it's enough to hire um, developers for specific tasks and we have a full-time developer and one part-time developer at the moment. Um, but it's not enough to like, get a huge team together and just solve a problem with brute force. That's not going to happen. Um, so this is why we have to improve compatibility with other, other projects. We are an open source community and we have to work together with other communities. And then the third category is uh, working towards world dominance. Um, what exactly is that? Um, didn't I just say before that we want to uh, work on compatibility and uh, collaborate? Yes, um, but that doesn't really, um, that can work together. Okay, let's look at the first category in some more detail. At, let's look at some specific action items. So the, the most important one is definitely move to a supported Ubuntu base. Ubuntu Touch at the moment is still running on Ubuntu 15.04 and uh, that is end of life. And it's been end of life for a couple of years now. That's a very bad situation because um, it forced us to um, backport a lot of security issues. For example, if you, if you remember last year, Crack and Blueborn, um, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth security vulnerabilities, those very much affect your phone and uh, you really want to have those fixed. So uh, we had to backport those ourselves. Um, and of course, um, memory leaks in low levels of the, of the, uh, of the stack. Um, updates to all components of the stack, uh, we need to get them from upstream. And also, it's, it helps us a lot if we, uh, it helps upstream a lot if we can uh, make our changes and our improvements available to them again. So that's why we really need to work on getting uh, to 16.04. Why not 18.04? On the one hand, it's because we really don't like the word bionic. Uh, and on the other hand, it's uh, because it doesn't really bring something new. Uh, 16.04 is still going to be supported until 2021. We hope that we won't use up that time frame entirely. Um, but at least as soon as we are on 16.04, we will uh, have some air to breathe. So um, we are working on this and Canonical has been working on uh, making Ubuntu Touch work on 16.04 before already. Um, but we are, I think, um, one or two months before we can have a final uh, release candidate that people can really try out as a daily driver and where people can, uh, can then come in and say, okay, uh, this is the only issue I find. Um, and uh, another reason why we have to stay on 16.04 for now or why we chose to stay on 16.04 as a first um, target is that uh, system D is a big issue on phones because you need some special kernel patches and kernel patches on Android phones are always difficult because every phone has their own kernel of the 3.x series and um, you have to uh, you really have to know what you're doing if you want to administer those patches. And uh, we, we experimented some, with some patches that are available for some of the devices already and um, the experience wasn't that amazing. Um, so that is why we stick to 16.04 for now, at least as a first target, because we still have upstart in 16.04 and it works okay. So this is why 16.04 is the next big development target. 
And here, sorry for the cringy image, I really uh, couldn't think of anything else but a white background for resolving uh, critical bugs. Of course, if you want to make a daily driver device, you want to resolve critical hardware issues. Um, I talked about the Fairphone before. At the moment, um, it sometimes reboots three, four times a day, and that is really annoying. Um, Friday, when I arrived here, no, Thursday, when I arrived here, um, before the, the uh, evening event, I uh, set up an alarm clock and I thought, okay, I will take a one hour nap. So uh, I set up an alarm clock and uh, it was, uh, I think, six in the evening. And then I woke up the next morning at eight o'clock. I slept very little the night before. <laughs> And I saw, okay, please enter your fin PIN number. So my phone had rebooted just when the alarm clock was supposed to ring. And uh, this is something that cannot happen on a daily driver device, right? So uh, this is uh, an important task for us, for the core development team. We have to resolve the critical issues so people can get attached to the product and uh, can then come in and solve some of the easier to solve issues and really can uh, leverage the community support over this. We don't have a very strong uh, negotiating position going in um, with uh, OEMs, so installation has to be super easy. Um, we have been working on this tool for a while. It's called the UbiPorts installer. Not very creative, but okay. Um, and the goal with this is to make uh, installation so easy that everybody can do it. My mother should be able to do it. In fact, I tried it with her and uh, it gave an error. Uh, so we still have some work on, to do on there, um, but at least it's on a good way. It's available as a snap now. It's uh, fully, fully confined even. On, so you should be able to uh, use it on any Linux distribution just to run snap install, ubports installer, and uh, you should be able to install it on a supported device. Another important area is um, Unity 8. Unity 8 is the, the desktop environment that is uh, running on, on Ubuntu Touch. It's a new generation of the Unity desktop and the Unity experience. If you look around, it looks very familiar. It looks pretty much like uh, Unity 7, just a little more modern. At the moment, we are not using the latest development version on the phones of Unity 8. And there's a lot of improvements um, already there that haven't landed on the phones yet. For example, you have um, global menus, which is, in my opinion, was an amazing feature of Unity 7. And you have that in Unity 8 now. You have the, um, the head-up display, the HUD, so where you can search the global menus. And it's, um, if you think about it, it's, a, it's really a very interesting feature for the phones because um, what we saw in the video earlier, you don't have that problem anymore because you don't have to be like, okay, I want to save. I, I, want, to, I, I want to save because a global menu is really much, uh, it's really only a, a list of text and you can arrange that on touchscreen and you can rearrange it and move items around and um, you can really, it's, it's an option to really adjust the, the global menu to a touch interface. And they, they did an, an, an amazing job in the, in the canonical Unity 8 development team there, and uh, I really love it. So we need to bring that to the phones, and what we will also do, and what we also started already, is to bring Unity 8 to the desktop as well. Um, we have a PPA available and an installation script where you can um, basically just run a script and then you can uh, use Unity 8 and uh, try it out on normal Ubuntu. Of course, it's not for daily driving yet, and um, it's not something where you can say, okay, I don't need my Mate, uh, my uh, Gnome, or whatever anymore. So uh, it's still very much in development, but at least it uh, lowers the entry bar because the developer then doesn't need a full device and doesn't need to, to buy a device or, or anything. or doesn't need to use a crappy emulator, uh, but can just use it natively on his, uh, on his um, desktop. And that's really what you want. I mean, after all, we are pushing for convergence. We say, okay, we use the same software stack across all devices. So it's a little ridic ridiculous when you can only do the development work on, on the phone. You really have to push from both sides if you want convergence. You have to... Uh, you really have to do that. 
So the second category is comp uh, compatibility and collaboration. We already talked about it a little. Um, like uh, moving to 16.04 also plays in this category a little. Uh, having Unity 8 on the desktop plays in this category a little. But um, there are some that really specifically belong here. For example, Mir and Wayland. Um, we already talked about Mir. It's an alternative display server and it also does some, uh, some extra stuff. And uh, it was an, a, a project from Canonical and uh, they did not give it up. So Mir is still in development from Canonical. They also changed their, their direction. So they uh, said, okay, we don't have to um, push our own protocol for Mir. And uh, Mir is now in the latest version compatible with Wayland. And this is uh, very interesting for us because Wayland has very widely been adopted uh, by the industry as the, the future standard. Um, but um, so m most applications will usually only support the Wayland uh, uh, API. So if we can continue to use Mir with Unity 8, because Mir and Unity 8 are very tied in together, and Mir, in fact, is a very, very high quality piece of code, um, that helps us a lot. And we are very grateful uh, to the Canonical Mir team. A big shout out to um, Alan Griffiths, um, who really supports us a lot and really uh, tries to uh, make our lives easier there because um, they try to continue um, parts of, of Mir that we depend on and uh, we try to help them. For example, we uh, try to make some improvements to X uh, Wayland support in Mir so that uh, um, traditional X applications or Wayland applications in the future um, don't look uh, like Windows 19.5 like we, like we saw it in the video before. So will, every application will essentially feel native. So this is something we have to do. We have to bring the latest version of Mir with Wayland support. We have to bring that to the phones and we have to make uh, um, Ubuntu Touch work with it and Unity 8 work with the latest version of Mir and we have to get Wayland support. Other packages. Um, at the moment on Ubuntu Touch we use a um, a special kind of package, it's called click package. It's essentially a Debian package on speed. Um, the reason why we need this is that we normally don't use apt um, to deliver updates, but we build um, an image of the whole system on our server, distribute it, and um, then extract it on the phone and just overwrite the whole root file system. So if you were to go in and, um, and remount your root file system as read-write, which you can do, and then install an app package, a Debian package, um, and then by the next update it will be lost. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the reason why for most applications we use these click packages. They are basically just the Debian package that doesn't get extracted and doesn't get scattered across your system, but it just stays in your home folder, it stays clean, and um, you don't have to yeah, scatter it across your system. The problem with that is nobody else uses it, not really. So um, we need to think about uh, ways to support other packages as well, so that other people can install our applications and that we can install other people's applications. There are some, uh, some options for us, of course. Uh, it, might be a, um, it might be a good idea to move away from this image-based upgrade system that I uh, just explained where you override your whole root file system, but it's also possible to install Debian uh, packages in a specific location and then exclude that from the whole upgrade process. So we have to look at that. So that would be an option to install Debian packages and uh, um, and keep them across an update. The other possibility is uh, Snap, which is also a, kind of, a technology that Canonical is pushing and that uh, survived the, yeah, the end of the world a year ago, um, which is also a new packaging format that doesn't get scattered across the system. It's a lot more complex than uh, clicks um, because uh, Snaps are essentially a virtual a file system that gets mounted on runtime and um, they have a lot of extra stuff. It's a very elegant system, in fact. Um, 
And yeah, after that, we have some, uh, some other packaging formats that are also interesting to look at. Um, flat packs or uh, app images, uh, um, two of the, uh, the examples. Um, but we will probably focus on these in the first run because it would allow us for a lot, uh, it would allow us to do a lot more collaboration with uh, the rest of the Ubuntu community and the Debian community as well, of course. So these are the most, the two most likely candidates. Then we have to support other UI toolkits. Um, Ubuntu back then made the decision, or Canonical back then made the decision to create their own UI toolkit uh, to, uh, that supported this um, design language, this Suru design language. Um, it's based on, on, uh, on Qt and CreaML. Uh, and it allows you to, to build very beautiful and very um, responsive applications. So you can build applications that really adapt to every screen size, to every uh, to windowed mode, to every input method. So it works great with, uh, with touch. It works great with the mouse and the keyboard and everything. And um, that was their idea, their, their idea back then, um, to build their own toolkit. Um, by now, some other standards have emerged. Um, for example, uh, Qt Crit Controls is a very uh, popular one, or Kirigami from uh, KDE. Um, we are, at the moment, we are working on um, creating a theme for Qt Crit Controls. So you can, uh, you can build a, uh, an application in Qt Crit Controls, and it will look like Suru. It will look like a native Ubuntu Touch application. And uh, that takes a lot of work off our shoulders because uh, we don't have to support our own toolkit anymore. Of course, it, it will not go away, but uh, going forward, we would always recommend uh, using a generic toolkit. And uh, then also it's easier to bring our applications to a different platform. It allows for more co collaboration, which is really what we want in this um, stage of the project. Um, hang on, I'm to plug in. I'm sorry. <laughs> Which one can I plug out? Oh, yeah. Okay, um, another thing we are working on and that we have uh, working in the proof of concept stage at the moment is Nbox. Um, it's an Android container, again, that um, allows you to use APKs and classic uh, Android applications in a GNU Linux system. It's a little weird that you have an Android container on the bottom, then you have your full GNU Linux stack and then you have your Android applications running again, but there's just some stuff that you need on a phone. For most people, if I tell them, hey, I'm working on this, uh, on this uh, awesome project, it's all freedom lovey, loving and, uh, and happy, fun time, uh, but then they say, okay, it's the WhatsApp, and they say no, and they say, okay, goodbye. Mm -hmm. So this is a big problem for us, and uh, we had, for quite a while, we had an, uh, an experimental WhatsApp client, an unofficial in one, but it doesn't look like that's going to be continued to be supported. So um, it's, it's not a good idea for our developers to waste their time reverse engineering an API of a proprietary service and uh, then have all the work be diminished just by a decision of that company that just says, okay, we shut this down and uh, you are all banned. So uh, this is a waste of time and resources. So this is why we say, okay, also supporting Android applications is the right step. This is not supposed to replace our current ecosystem. It's, uh, it's supposed to complement it. So if you depend on an application like WhatsApp, um, if you depend on an application like, for example, car sharing or something, which often doesn't have um, a web app or something available, which doesn't have an open API, then you will be able to use the, the Android APK. Oftentimes, there is an APK download available, 
uh, from an independent side or from the, uh, the, um, the company itself. For example, this is the case for WhatsApp. So on, on whatsapp.com, you can just download an APK and then run it in Nbox already. So this is already a thing that you can use on Ubuntu on the desktop, for example. Um, and uh, so this is how you, how you uh, would probably do it in most cases. And then there's alternative Android stores like F-Droid, which is a very popular one, or there's also a couple different ones, like for example, there's the Amazon one. And in theory, you would also be able to install, uh, or no, in, in practice also, <laughs> you're able to install Google Play services again, but then you're in a situation where you are like, uh, okay, I worked so hard to get rid of Android, and now I have Google Play services again, you might not want that. But if you do want that, it is possible. And of course, it's all containerized, so it, uh, it can't really spy on you that much, because uh, if you close the container, it's gone. It's not running. So this is uh, something uh, we decided to do as well. As I said, it's in a proof of concept stage at the moment. It's only supported on two devices, the Pro 5 and the M10 tablet at the moment, and um, um, other devices will get it in the future, but it also requires some special kernel patches, and again, they are pretty difficult to administer on the, on the uh, Android devices. Yeah, um, again, we, were very, uh, we are criticized by some people that it would kill our own ecosystem, but I don't think that's going to, be, to happen, because um, if we really manage to support all the packages, if we really manage to support um, all the user interface toolkits, then it becomes a platform that's a lot more interesting as a development target. Um, because if you ever try to build an Android application, yes, there's a million systems available, but they all suck. And uh, working on Linux is a lot more fun, at least for us, I would assume. So. Um, this is why I think uh, this will not kill us. This is, will actually really help us a lot. So the third category in uh, tasks we are tackling at the moment is uh, world dominance. Um, you might have heard this uh, last week. It was announced that um, UbiPods will partner with Purism, um, an American Linux laptop manufacturer, to um, bring Ubuntu Touch to the Librem 5. The Librem 5 is a, a concept phone, and a, it, it uh, also came from a Kickstarter campaign that uh, ran last August. Um, and the goal there is to build a phone with a classic GNU Linux uh, hardware abstraction. So you don't need all that uh, Android stuff anymore. And you would just uh, be able, in theory, to install any, um, uh, any Linux distribution and uh, just be done with it. But of course, you still need, need something or you want something that, is, that adapts to your, uh, to your mobile user interface. And um, they partnered up with uh, KDE to bring KDE Plasma to this device pretty early. Um, and uh, they themselves will work on um, something based on GNOME, which is called PureOS and um, we will try to make Ubuntu Touch work on this device. Um, it's all in the future, and it's all pretty vague still, but uh, we are very excited about it, and we really hope that it will be a successful campaign. Um, they collected, I think, just over $2 million to build this, so it is a very, um, it is a very ambitious goal, because, as, as we saw, Canonical collected uh, $10 million more and said, okay, we cannot do this, and they didn't even have the, the um, uh, free driver aspect in there. So it is a very, um, it is a very ambitious campaign, but uh, I, I guess everybody would really like this to succeed, even if it's not perfect in the first uh, rendition, which we don't have that much uh, impact on, of course, but we would really like to, uh, we are really motivated to offer Ubuntu Touch on that as well, and uh, we will, I think, in one month or something, we will uh, receive the first development boards and then we will be able to, to uh, work towards this. So this is very important. Um, if you want everybody to be able to use it, it needs to be available somewhere. You can make the installation process as easy as, uh, as it's humanly possible, um, 
flashing a phone is always intimidating. You see it uh, on, on Ubuntu on the desktop as well. It's very easy to install Ubuntu on most devices, like download an ISO and you're done. Uh, but still many people don't do it because it's too intimidating. So you need to be available in stores as well. This is of course a very uh, niche device and um, going forward you would need more hardware partners and more mainstream devices as well available with this, but it's a first step, it's a step in the right direction. So this is one, uh, find hardware partners. Another step towards world domination is uh, use current business trends. In the moment, at the moment we see ARM um, rising everywhere, we see um, uh, Internet of Things, uh, manufacturers really pushing for Linux drivers for these devices and uh, we hope that we will be able to really use this trend in our favor. Um, because if we have the same, the same hardware or very, very similar hardware with Linux drivers, um, it will probably help us. At least that's what we hope will happen. And uh, this is something why we think we are now in a, in a situation well, we have a much better, uh, better standing than uh, Canonical did uh, three years ago. And uh, finally, you want uh, to embrace the power of, uh, of uh, free software. You know, you, can, uh, you have so many options um, to collaborate. You have so many options to, uh, um, to get funding. Uh, that you don't have when you're very uh, when you're very um, commercial project. So this is also why I think uh, we have some uh, a small advantage than that Canonical didn't have. Canonical is faced with a lot of uh, unreasonable hate in uh, in some areas, and it's also faced with some reasonable hate in some other areas uh, because there are some decisions. Uh, that you can really argue about. Um, I often try to defend them, um, but there are, uh, there are definitely areas where you can really criticize Canonical, and that's completely okay. Um, I was a little weirded out by this, uh, but when we said, okay, we are going to take over Ubuntu Touch, some people came in and said, okay, um, now that it's no longer a canonical project, I like it, and now I will contribute. <laughs> um, it, is, it is a little weird, uh, because uh, you really have to admit that canonical did great things for the whole Linux community. Without canonical and without Ubuntu, um, we obviously wouldn't here to be here today because it's the Ubicon, but uh, also the, the whole Linux world would look very, very different. I'm very sure about that. And uh, so we should probably also thank Canonical in, some, in many areas. But yeah, we, we really need to embrace uh, the community. We really need to embrace the bazaar. I don't know if you read the, the book, um, The Cathedral and the Bazaar. Read it. It's also, uh, it, there's also two copies, I think, at our booth um, in the main hall. Uh, it's a very good book. It's about uh, how to use the, um, uh, how to set up your community in order to, uh, to become a successful open source project. And it was a really, uh, yeah, it's a really interesting book. Okay, so uh, this concludes the strategy plan. Um, create a daily driver ready device, improve compatibility, and work towards world dominance. Um, thanks a lot for your attention and uh, we have uh, 10 more minutes and maybe we can uh, discuss a little. I would really like to hear your thoughts about uh, the stuff I talked about and maybe you have uh, questions about specifics. Um, not by the core team. Um, as, as we saw, the, the Halium project, which aims to um, 
did I really talk about this? No, I didn't really talk about this. <laughs> Interesting, okay. Uh, so the Halium project aims to standardize this uh, hardware uh, abstraction layer, this Linux, uh, this Android container. So the idea there is that you only port um, a device once and then it runs um, Plasma Mobile, it runs Ubuntu Touch, and in theory also every other project that builds on this. So it's a collaborative effort from uh, uh, the KDE community and the UbiPorts community. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, at the moment, our focus is not bringing in another tablet, even though I would really like it because Ubuntu Touch is pretty uh, fun on a tablet. Um, but at the moment, it's not the, the first goal, no. Yeah? <coughs> That would be a very interesting thing. Yeah, um, we talked with some of the uh, members of the community council already, and um, and they seem to be very uh, happy or very. Uh, yeah, uh, supportive of this idea to make uh, Ubuntu Touch an official flavor. Um, we'll have to wait with that. Uh, on the one hand, we, we really need more support from the community in order to bring Unity 8 to a state where it can replace another desktop environment. Or, uh, yeah, essentially, you, you wouldn't want to, um, to take away the, the, the cake of someone else. That's not a saying, I don't know. Um, so we, we would have to think about that. Um, if we made Ubuntu Touch in a flavor, at the moment it wouldn't really be possible because the, the requirements for a flavor are very much set out around the, the normal update workflow with dev packages and everything. So if you look at the, at the list of requirements, um, it's um, yeah too to participate in the normal QA workflow of Ubuntu, and uh, that doesn't really fit the way we work on Ubuntu Touch at the moment with these image-based upgrades. Um, it would be an interesting idea to make Ubuntu Touch an official flavor. At the moment, it's not the first step, but uh, it might be something interesting going forward. Um, it depends. It really depends on the area. I'm not working on it myself uh, <laughs> that much, really. So uh, I'm not 100% sure. It's it's a moving target as well. So uh, it's really it. What we want to do to do with Halium is define a standard, just agree on common ground, identify some components that we both use. For example, libhybris is the is the centerpiece essentially because that is what con, uh, what translates the driver calls from uh, Bionic to glibc, and that is what everybody uses normally. And then uh, Plasma Mobile, for example, already uses um, uh, systemd, and we don't. Uh, uh, so we um, had a lot of discussions if systemd should be part of uh, of Halium or not. Um, Plasma Mobile is in the very um, pleasant situation that they are not daily driver ready yet. Uh, so they uh, can just make a decision to break a compatibility, uh, break a feature and sa just say, okay, this will just not work for the next uh, couple of months. And, but if we do that and we release a new stable version, then we will probably piss off a lot of people and we don't want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Diogo has stars that, uh, that scars that uh, we cannot hear. <laughs> yeah, so um, I think it's uh, at the moment uh, it's probably more uh, plasma that is working on it um, because, as we just saw, we have a lot of other tasks as well, and we are a small team. Uh, but plasma is also not uh, not a hundred people uh, venture. So yeah.